thank you for joining us. My name is Lynn Schmidt McQuitty, and I am the Strategic Initiative Leader for Healthy Families and Communities. And today, along with my colleague Deanne Meyer, who's the Strategic Initiative for Sustainable Food Systems, we'd like to welcome everybody to our Food Systems Resiliency webinar series. Um, just a few logistical things before we get started. Uh, keep in mind that we are going to be recording this session so that we can uh, use it for educational purposes in the future. We'd like everyone to please post your questions in the Q&A box, which is down on the bottom part of your screen. And we'll facilitate those questions near the end of the presentation. Then use your chat box for non-question conversations or comments. Um, so make sure that uh, you're recording or you're uh, sending your email or your chat question to the appropriate person so that um, not everybody gets it if we don't all need to. And then um, if you want to send a, a, a chat to the panelists, you can do that. Or if you want everyone to see it, you can send it to everyone. Next slide. So today um, is the second series, second in our series for, on food resiliency, with the, the opportunity or the focus to really start to think about reimagining our food system from the processing and production all the way to accessibility. I think many of you on the call today may have been with our first session. And uh, as we move through the end of the rest of the calendar year, we'll have meetings every other Tuesday. So every second and fourth Tuesday of the month, we'll be meeting to talk about the various components of the food system. So we're hoping that we're glad that you're here today, but we're also hoping you can join us in the future. Next slide. Our goal is really to provide um, information, knowledge, and understanding about what it, what it means to have a resilient food system, to share information and um, available existing documents and resources for people to identify information gaps, to brainstorm together to think about what some of the next steps might be, and then also to recruit additional participants. And by that, what we're really hoping will come out of some of these conversations is not only a greater understanding and awareness of what's going on within our food system, but that maybe through some of the presentations and through some of the questions generated, that we might be thinking about new partnerships in order to come together, collaborate, and address these questions. Next slide. So to, um, next week, we will feature, or excuse me, our next session, excuse me, will be on August 11th from 10 to 11, and we'll focus on the ins and outs of niche marketing meat. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, primarily what's going on with the beef industry right now, and discuss some opportunities for um, what's happening there and come to, together to talk about various solutions around marketing, around processing, and uh, the role that beef plays in, in California economics. Next slide. So this morning, I'm going to introduce to you my colleague, Kamal Kahara, the director of the CalFresh Healthy Living Program at UC. And she has been really um, instrumental in her whole life at looking at food systems, how to create partnerships, and managing um, access to food and creating healthy, nutritious environments for young people and adults. Um, she's been working with uh, nutrition education programs for over 30 years and is relatively new to UC Ann Arbor, but has been um, very well known as a graduate of UC Davis and also working in the field of health, nutrition education and nutrition assistance. So she presently manages the UC CalFresh program, which as you all know, um, works to improve diet nutrition related skills for adults and youth and in cooperation with 30 of our UC Cooperative Extension Accounting Offices. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kamal to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, Lynn. And my work is so easy today because I've been fortunate to um, know and assemble a group of three talented speakers today who are quite expert in the subject of reaching folks with nutritious foods, 
both from a large perspective, a regional perspective, statewide perspective, and really in California, which we know, we oftentimes set the stage for a national pilot work and folks look west when we talk about um, innovative food system work, as we know. And right now in our world, this is such a uh, high priority, as we know the rates of, of hunger and malnourishment are um, unparalleled. So again, thank you, Lynn, for the introduction. I have spent most of my career in this space. Um, when I used to work for the American Heart Association, I used to always hope that I would get myself out of a job because the nutrition education and the health education and the chronic disease prevention work that I dedicated myself to, I was hoping would make a difference and make a dent. And so unfortunately, I'm still in this work because there's still work to do. But again, I'm really lucky today because I um, don't have to do a bunch. I just get to introduce our three panelists. So our first panelist today is Brian Kaiser. Brian is the Bureau Chief for the CalFresh Nutrition Program Family Engagement and Empowerment Division at the California Department of Social Services. And this part of our state government has been working 130%, if not more. The staff are just um, dedicated to helping folks in California receive the benefits that they need. <clears throat> A little more about Brian. So Brian joined the CalFresh nutrition branch at the California Department of Social Services in May of 2016. Um, as the CalFresh and Nutrition Programs Bureau Chief, he leads California's Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, CSFP for seniors, the CalFresh Outreach Program, and the state's CalFresh Healthy Living SNAP Ed programs. Brian has a bachelor's degree in geography as well as an MBA in economics from the U University of Nevada at Reno. And before joining the Department of Social Services, he spent nearly 20 years as a housing and demographic analyst for UNR. So I'm going to pass over um, our presentation to Brian, who has been just a joy to work with. Thank you, Kamal. So very nice introduction. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this group to help, um, even though it's a sort of a fast fly through of uh, our programs, I think it's really timely, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, given what's happening in the world today. Uh, we can't over communicate uh, what the network looks like and how it's changing and adapting. Um, so I really appreciate uh, having uh, my 10 minutes with you guys uh, to help uh, set the stage and be here to answer some of the questions. Uh, so next slide, please. I wanted to just uh, touch briefly on what the CalFresh family of brands looks like. Um, I think given the participants of, of this group, um, I think many of you probably already are familiar with CalFresh, but given the rebranding that happened over the last couple of years, I just wanted to make sure we take this opportunity to recognize what CalFresh means in California, because it is, it's more than just uh, food stamps, which, you know, we spent quite a bit of time trying to move move through that, uh, move through to a, a new way of thinking about food assistance beyond just food stamps. Um, we have the CalFresh Food Program, which is what we consider to be our EBT. That's the federal food assistance program in California. Um, an incredibly large program serving uh, well over 4 million people each month. Um, it's uh, probably one of the largest anti-poverty programs in the country, if not the largest. Um, also, we operate the CalFresh ENT Employment and Training Program, and really the the idea behind that is providing pathways for people to lift them out of poverty. Um, that program, probably more than anything under the CalFresh umbrella, has changed so dramatically over the last few years. Um, just in the five or so years that I've been a part of CalFresh, uh, it went from a very tiny niche with a few counties participating and one full-time staff dedicated to it to um, most counties participating. It is optional in California. We have an entire section with, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 people dedicated to uh, supporting ENT in California today um, and still on a trajectory for just massive growth. So ENT is definitely uh, becoming a larger part of our program each and every day. Um, disaster response, unfortunately, has also become a huge piece of what we do in California. Um, thinking through uh, the fires that happen on a, a, a shockingly frequent basis, um, 
our uh, disaster cal fresh benefit used to be something that was offered very very irregularly and now it's something that seems to happen uh, multiple times a year over the last several years so we we are also thinking of the uh, pandemic ebt response under our disaster uh, response uh, umbrella as well um, so it's expanding unfortunately that's that is the world we live in but um, also part of the calfresh family um, and then also healthy living that Kamal had had alluded to uh, we run the uh, snap ed program in california which is a, a just a massive network of nutrition education support and providers uh in california so just wanted to sort of set the stage for for my frame of reference uh here today uh next slide please so i mentioned uh cal fresh food the ebt program in california um, and i just wanted to spend a minute speaking directly to how things have changed in response to COVID over the last few months um, our caseload is at a record high and it is uh growing every day so as of as of may so the, these numbers are, are a little bit old we were serving uh 4.7 million people in california and 2.6 million households that is the highest number we have ever seen in California. Um, just since February, rewind a couple months when the COVID uh, crisis was really ramping up, we've seen nearly a 20% increase in the number of people we serve in California. And that for a program this size and at this scale is truly staggering uh, to see a 20% increase. Our county partners that administer this program, that implement the program, um, in many cases are also working from home. So we have about 300 offices, uh, county offices statewide that administer this program um, with thousands and thousands of eligibility workers in California. Um, in many cases, they're also working remote. In many cases, they're also working with a skeleton crew. So to have our, uh, our county support uh, impacted at the same time that the caseload just uh, went through a tremendous spike and is continuing um, each and every day to increase um, is truly, truly shocking for the system. Um, but also really, really proud and happy that we are able to provide this type of a resource for people at a time when they really, really need it. Um, on the policy side, we've been working with our USDA partners uh, on some waivers. Um, and all of those waivers are really designed to increase program access and help alleviate some of the burden on the county side to help them work through the backlog. Um, some of those are temporary. Well, I'd say all of those are temporary for now, but really pushing to keep those extensions in place as long as we possibly can, uh, recognizing that this crisis is not over. It's not a one or two month uh, ordeal. Um, and that's something that's, that's taken a little bit of work with our federal partners to help keep keep the momentum um, and keep some of these uh, flexibilities in place because things that were offered initially that, that uh, have started to, to be pulled back um, at a moment when, especially in California, we haven't seen the peak. We haven't seen, seen the situation get better. We're still very much in the first wave. So it's important that we, uh, we do what we can uh, to help increase access and help our county partners um, implement this program. Uh, the ABOD time limit, the able-bodied adults without dependents time limit that was set to go statewide has been temporarily suspended, uh, which is huge. That was a the tremendous negative program impact that we were all braced for. Uh, fortunately, that is uh, temporarily suspended while we work through this crisis. So that is huge and was just announced within the last two months. Um, in another huge win for the uh, CalFresh Food Program, uh, EBT Online, which is something we have wanted to do for many, many years, but for a variety of technical reasons, um, has been really tough to, to get off the ground. Um, that went live a few months ago, and we're working through Amazon.com and Walmart.com for the time being, um, with the intention to roll that out even more broadly to other retailers. Um, there's a small pilot with Safeway that's uh, rolling out in the Bay Area right now, uh, with the expectation that more and more of the Safeway network will also come online as well. But this is a huge win for access. Um, imagining that people aren't out in community, um, particularly thinking of vulnerable populations and older adults that um, were the first ones to be asked to stay home and, and limit their exposure. Being able to offer EBT online uh, is just a huge win for access. And I'm really, really thrilled that that's come together. Um, 
still put some things to work through. It's not perfect. It doesn't reach everyone, but it is a massive step forward. And I'm really happy that that's come together in California. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight for CalFresh Food was the emergency allotments that, that uh, have been happening for the last several months. So on average, in a, any given month, we issue about $550 million worth of benefits uh, via the EBT system to people in need. With the emergency allotments that we've been approved to, uh, to operate for the last few months, we are able to bump everyone's benefit up to the maximum um, based on their household size. So to the extent that at least a million or so households in California weren't already at the max benefit, it brought all of them up to, to the max. Um, and what that did was free up another $250 million-ish each month in benefits for food. Um, so in somewhere around 700 to $750 million a month in food benefits are going out in California each month during the pandemic. And that is a tremendous uh, number um, and provides real relief to, to families who need it. Um, and the other thing that, that has uh, been stood up really from scratch um, over the last few months is the pandemic EBT response. So knowing that uh, so many children in California rely on school meals to receive uh, a good, good portion of their, their nutrition uh, with schools closed, everyone distance learning, um, we had to pivot very quickly to figure out a solution um, and working with our friends at the California Department of Education, um, we're able to stand up the PEBT program um, virtually overnight uh, to provide uh, $365 per child, uh, which is the value of the meals they would have received for the remainder of the school year. Um, and I'll go to the next slide to give you some of the metrics on PEBT. Um, because the program reach for this program, um, particularly given how quickly it was stood up, is, is pretty uh, staggering. We estimated initially that about 3.8 million children in California would be eligible for the PEBT program. So far, as of last week, we had issued 3.4 million uh, cards. So 3.8 million children uh, had been issued a card. Um, of those, that's about 89% of who we expected to serve from the outset, um, having access to those cards. So there's a little bit of a lag given how quickly this, this is all rolling out between the time we issue the cards and when they're actually activated and pinned. So as of last week, about 73% of the cards that had been issued had actually been activated, pinned, and ready to use. Uh, so that covers about 2.8 million children in California with access to the PEBT card. So overall, we were expecting almost $1.3 billion to be made available through this, this program. As of last week, about 844 million had been spent, swiped through the EBT. So people are not only accessing the card, but they are um, immediately turning that into food for their household and going shopping with it, which is exactly what we wanted to see happen. Uh, so really uh, an incredible amount of work went into getting this benefit started from scratch and then a network of support, a call center that's operating, that's receiving quite literally um, tens of thousands of calls every week. Um, all of those messages returned and all happening in-house at the CalFresh branch. It's been uh, pretty incredible to say the least, but uh, also very proud about that. Uh, the next slide, please. I apologize for talking very, very quickly, but I um, assume we will have some time at the end for me to uh, share more and have uh, some Q&A. So I'm, I'm gonna move through these as fast as I can. So I apologize for talking so quick. Um, the other piece I wanted to speak to for the CalFresh branch was just what's happening outside of CalFresh food, outside of the EBT programs. Um, we work very closely with about 50 food bank partners in California. Um, as many of you know, not everyone is on CalFresh. Not everyone is eligible and not everyone chooses to make themselves um, or to take advantage of that benefit, even if they are eligible. For them, there is a food bank network that um, in many cases, that is their go-to. That's their first, first line um, when they're hungry. Um, for, for this group, they were the food banks were impacted um, with such a significant increase in demand almost overnight, food banks in California were seeing an exponential growth in demand. So when you plan the food, your, your warehouse supplies, your donations, when you're, when you're trying to plan your, your operations, uh, generally no food bank is planning for an exponential growth overnight in, in demand. So they were hit with a shock of 
uh, people lining up at their doors in ways that they have never seen in the past and simultaneously getting hit with a decrease in food bank uh, volunteer support. So the business model for many food banks relies on volunteers to get that food out the door. Uh, many of those volunteers are older adults and they were not leaving their homes to come volunteer and that put food banks in a bind. So we've, we've been working very closely with the food banks in California on both fronts. So the state of California has afforded us $75 million to purchase food boxes to distribute on top of the private donations and federal food that goes through our food bank system. Um, so that's going to assist about 2.7 million families over the next year, um, trying to meter that out. Obviously that could be, uh, that supply could be eaten up very, very quickly, but we're trying to meter that supply out to help uh, bolster the supplies that are already at food banks. Um, and on the federal side, our TFAP, Emergency Food Assistance Program, has received almost three times the amount of funding for administrative and food um, in this fiscal year. And that is truly surprising. I don't think any of us expected our TFAP program on the federal side to receive that much of an augmentation, but um, also truly, truly happy to see the extra food coming in and the extra um, admin allowance to allow food banks to hire more staff, get temporary uh, refrigerators as needed, uh, spend the money that they need to in the moment to respond. So that is a terrific support that's come in the door that we've been working with our food banks to administer. Um, I mentioned the volunteer support. We've been working very closely with the California National Guard and Cal Volunteers to help bolster the volunteer reserves um, at each of the food banks um, and also get them onto a, a sustainable plan for the future on how they might um, do things differently with their volunteer system. So the Cal Volunteers crew has been working very closely with them. CalGuard is still actively engaged in many um, dozens of food banks in California, providing on the ground direct support for them. Um, and that will last for over the next several months, they will, they will remain engaged as they work through a transition plan. But that's been very timely uh, for our food banks. We've also provided um, PPE, so no cost uh, masks, sanitizer, and therm thermometers to our food bank network to ensure that we have a safe supply of food that goes out. And uh, that safety is really critical because if one food bank goes down, that's thousands or tens of thousands of people that would normally rely on that, that stream of food. So it's been very important that we help bring in resources to make sure that they've got the, the safety equipment that they need. Um, and also working really closely with our tribal partners uh, to make sure that, that they're also receiving food uh, from our state funded food boxes and federal sources. Uh, they're not always connected with our food bank network and uh, just an acknowledgement that our tribal partners are just as needy, if not needier, um, and don't always um, have the same connections as everyone else. So we've been really trying to stay connected with them deeply throughout the last few months um, and working with them over the coming year as well to make sure that they've got a supply of food showing up. Um, on the CalFresh outreach side, we've been working with our network of partners on toolkits and website updates, just making sure we're getting the message out, um, particularly around PEBT. That was a brand new benefit. No one knew about it. No one had heard of it. So getting the word out was really critical uh, to reaching the millions of people that needed to hear that message. Um, so CalFresh Outreach was working uh, really closely with our, our external network uh, to get that message out. Um, same with Healthy Living. So our CalFresh Healthy Living program, um, they've been deeply engaged with that network, trying to think through what the world looks like for uh, engagement in a non-face-to-face -face world. So with things going uh, more digital, thinking through how do we still provide the healthy living programming and messaging that we need to deliver in California in a world where face-to-face -face is challenging and face-to-face -face, uh, may look very different going forward. So a um, lot of change happening on the healthy living side and then same for uh, employment and training, um, leveraging technology to do things um, more digitally, less face-to-face, -face, and really providing um, different pathways for people in a, in a world that's uh, certainly changed dramatically over the last few months and in many ways may never go back to what we knew. Um, so CellEd is a partner that we've uh, been working with that is delivering uh, nutrition uh, and employment and training programming uh, digitally on many platforms, uh, cell phone or uh, tablet, laptop, that sort of thing, uh, providing avenues to get that training out to people. Um, and then also uh, CalFresh confirmed technology as a way of validating uh, people's engagement with EMT services so that we, they can also stay eligible for CalFresh. Um, 
so really putting some some effort into some digital strategies uh, for those programs at the moment when when things are really changing dramatically. So I'm going to pause there. I know we have time later for some Q&A. You can add that below in the Q&A and I can answer there and we will uh, move through the rest of our presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And I'm sorry that we didn't have more time. I think we could have given you the whole hour today, but thank you so much. And we'll, we'll get Q&A and people now can um, you know, reach out and reach uh, CDSS in all the different ways now that we know more about all the wonderful programs and benefits. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Andy. Andy Najaris, who's not a stranger to a lot of the folks on this call today, um, is a dear and important friend to me. <clears throat> Andy brings over 15 years of experience in community food systems work and education. He is the CEO of AIM, the Agricultural Institute of Marin, a Bay Area 501c3 educational nonprofit that connects communities and local regional food systems so the public can access healthy and sustainably grown food. He brings a unique perspective to nonprofit executive management after spending over 10 years with the federal government, including the CDC and USDA FNS, Food and Nutrition Services. Andy has successfully navigated these bureaucratic systems to affect change so that scientific evidence would drive policy and program decisions. These experiences have shaped much of Andy's thinking about designing food systems and how to nourish communities while supporting the financial viability of small to mid-sized producers in a way that is responsible, empowering, and socially just. And again, I've had the great honor of working with Andy for many years. Um, when we were teenagers, we started, and um, he's just one of a kind and an important leader in this space. So I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, Kamal, and thanks to my fellow panelists for allowing me to share the stage today. I'm going to talk about some of the impacts from COVID-19 to our local food system and discuss ways that we've been able to strengthen our food system to create more resilient outcomes for both producers and eaters and shoppers. So you can go to the next slide. So AIM, uh, we've been around for about 37 years as a 501c3 educational nonprofit. We're based in Marin, but our service area is actually three counties in the Bay Area, Marin County, San Francisco County, and Alameda County. And we operate seven year-round farmers markets, a seasonal market, a mobile market, as well as a variety of hands-on educational programs. We also seek to impact food policy and create supportive policies that will help to ensure that all families, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, geography, or background, are able to access and afford healthy farm fresh produce. We're also building a new center called the Center for Food and Agriculture. It will be what we think will be the world's most climate friendly farmers market in a welcoming space and providing opportunities for educational and community building for all. So um, anyway, you can go to the next slide. So back in uh, mid-March, we had learned about the, uh, first it was the Bay Area shelter in place order. And it came as, I mean, not a surprise, but also a shock thinking through, we're beginning our peak season of operating farmers markets and ensuring that many of our farmers and producers who depend on the farmers markets would have a place to sell and also ensure that we would be able to provide access to community members to continue shopping at the farmers market. And I'm going to talk about three ways that we've been able to uh, impact local food systems through our mobile farmers market, the Roll and Root, our certified farmers markets, as well as the Bounty Box, uh, a curbside farm box program today and describe how partnerships have been influential through these models. So you can go to the next slide. In operating certified farmers markets, it's been particularly important that we develop a clear set of guidelines focused on social distancing and health and safety. So farmers markets are uh, open air outdoor environments that are already highly regulated by county health departments and by uh, local ag departments but it was very important for us in ensuring that farmers markets would remain open, that we would have a safe and accessible place for people to shop. This work led us through uh, working with a variety of partners across the state, 
to going up to the governor's office to make sure that we would get a commitment that farmers markets would remain open as essential services. Um, for our small to mid-sized producers, farming just can't stop. Farming has to continue. Up until this point, you can't farm by Zoom. You have to be out in the field farming and planting and harvesting foods. Um, so we've been able to continue operating all seven of our open air farmers markets across the three counties where we work. And what we've seen is that for many of our customers, many of our market shoppers, it's been quite an incredible experience. Um, we've seen many people come to the farmer's market for the first time, regardless of income level. And much of the feedback from the community has been that people did not feel safe shopping in a confined uh, indoor environment. They wanted to shop outdoors. And also for many of our community members, they wanted to attend the farmer's market to buy local and responsibly produced food. Uh, partnerships with the county health department and county ag department and social services have really helped to ensure that farmers markets can remain open. But one of the most important features at the farmers market is the ability to accept CalFresh EBT along with offering a market match. So AIM is part of the California Market Match Consortium run by the Ecology Center and funded by the uh, Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. So we provide a, a match year round so people that use their EBT can receive up to $10 in market match funds per visit to the farmer's market and which they can use for fruits and vegetables. Um, you can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we observed is the uh, incredible uptake in our nutrition benefit programs at the farmer's market. So comparing the experience of June 2020 to June 2019, you can see across our different markets that we operate, we've seen between a two-fold to three-fold increase in the number of EBT transactions occurring at the farmer's market as well as the number of people that are uh, using market match and the value. So what we found is that for number one, because of the additional uh, supplement that was provided to families, as Brian mentioned, to receive the maximum amount, we found that more people were coming to the farmer's market to use their EBT and they were spending more by using their supplement. We also found that families were coming to the, to, to the farmer's market to use their pandemic EBT or PEBT. Families that receive both a, uh, they have a regular CalFresh card as well as a PEBT card, they can use both cards at the farmer's market on the same day, but they're only able to receive the market match once per day. Um, but we're continuing to see more and more families coming to the farmer's market to use their nutrition benefits. And this is critically important because not only does this ensure affordable access to local produce for our most vulnerable populations, but this is also a steady source of revenue for our small to mid-sized farmers who are able to use the redemptions to help pay for the fees and costs to be at the farmer's market. You can go to the next slide. In addition to operating our year-round stationary markets, we also operate a mobile farmer's market called the Roland Root. So our research has shown that two of the biggest barriers to eating healthy, especially during a pand pandemic, are transportation and price. So we've developed a model called the Roland Root. It's a farmer's market on wheels where we bring healthy products from the farmer's market, including fruits, vegetables, nuts, and dairy products to a variety of older adult communities and food desert communities in Marin County. This work is partially funded and supported by the CalFresh Healthy Living Program as an important policy systems and environmental change strategy. Throughout COVID-19 during the pandemic, the Roland Root has really provided a critical source of nutrition for many of our older adult populations, particularly those who are homebound. So throughout the shelter in place, we visit 12 to 13 different senior sites and community sites where for many of our older adult community members, this might be the only time that they leave their home during the week to come outside to buy produce, um, produce that they love, produce that they enjoy, and they're able to incorporate into meals for themselves or their families. Again, we've adopted a variety of important social distancing and health and safety guidelines for people to shop at the Roland Root. And we also provide a variety of different nutrition incentive programs, including CalFresh, both EBT and PEBT. We offer a market match up to $10 per day, as well as a variety of additional programs called Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program bonus bucks, as well as senior COVID-19 relief bucks, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. 
One of the things that we first realized is that for many of our older adults, one of, as I mentioned, a barrier to eating healthy is, is price, is the cost of food. And more and more of our older adults are focused on their nutritional needs, are seeking to buy responsibly produced and grown produce, and are seeking out options that are organic. So working in partnership with uh, Marin County Social Services, the SF Marin Food Bank, and Interfaith Foods, a partner organization that's based in Sonoma County, we were able to implement two different types of nutrition incentive programs that have been really invaluable during the COVID-19 pandemic. The first program that we were able to implement was a nutrition supplement that was awarded to older adults that newly enrolled in CalFresh through the SSI expansion. So when the state was able to reverse the SSI cash out and more older adults were able to enroll in the program for the first time, we were able to provide them with a matching incentive that they were able to use to buy healthy, mostly organic produce from the Roland Root or from our farmer's market sites. In addition, working with our partners through Interfaith Foods, we were also able to offer a variety of privately funded senior COVID relief bucks. These are fruit and vegetable vouchers in the amount of $4 that were distributed to older adults through a variety of senior housing partners including EH Housing, Mercy Housing, and a variety of uh, faith-based organizations. So that way older adults would have more purchasing power to buy local responsibly produced produce so they can help to boost their immunity and have a well-balanced diet. You can go to the next slide. The final component of our trio of COVID relief programs is our bounty box. So we also recognize when the shelter in place started that even though farmers markets remain open, that there are community members that are older adults or high risk that might be unable to shop the farmers market. We also face the problem where many of our small to mid sized farmers would be relying on selling to local restaurants in the Bay Area. During the shelter in place, many restaurants had their doors closed or their services disrupted and many of our small farmers lost upwards of 90 to 100% of their restaurant accounts. So we had small farmers that were still growing product, but were looking for buyers for this product. So AIM worked proactively with our variety of small farmers to develop a new program called the Bounty Box, which offers a box of assorted fruits and vegetables from the farmer's market that would be available for pre-order and curbside pickup at three of our seven farmer's markets. We were also able to generate private funding from Bank of America, where we could provide the bounty boxes at 50% off to anyone that's using their CalFresh card. So to date, we've been able to distribute over 5,000 bounty boxes to people that are in high risk categories or that would like to experience the joys and benefits of farm fresh produce without having to leave their car. People are able to pre-order a box of produce for pickup at the farmer's market, with the exception that for people that are using their CalFresh card, we're able to have them pre-order the box of produce, but right now we're not authorized as a retailer for the online payments program. So when people that use their CalFresh show up at the farmer's market, they have to swipe their EBT card with our wireless terminal to, in order to deduct that amount from their card for the day. You can go to the next slide. At the same time that we launched the Bounty Box program, uh, the USDA also implemented a new program called Farmers to Family as part of the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program that would identify ways to connect vulnerable families across the country with farmers that were producing products that might not have a buyer, which is in the same experience that we had here in the Bay Area. So AIM became part of a collective known as the Bay Area Farm Fresh Rel Food Relief Program. It's a it's a hub of nine organizations with 20 farmers working with 40 distribution sites around the seven Bay Area counties. And what we're able to do is to uh, pack additional bounty boxes. We pack about a, an additional 150 boxes per week that are then distributed to a variety of low income serving community sites throughout um, the Bay Area. So we work with six different distribution sites and partners. And we then get reimbursed by the USDA and then we use that funding to help pay the farmers for the cost of their products. We're seeing the response from our community partners is just, it's, it's been incredible. And the stories that we hear for many of our families that are receiving farm fresh produce, um, 
we hear more and more stories from families that are saying that they're unable to accept the commodities or the packaged or canned foods from food pantries that are often high in added sugar, salt, and fat, and they're not able to use those ingredients. So as an alternative, providing people with access to fresh produce helps to ensure that they'll be able to have culturally relevant and nutritionally adequate foods. Um, so the Bounty Box program is not only helping to support our small farmers, but it's also helping to redistribute produce to more families in need and to experience the joys and benefits of eating farm fresh produce, eating seasonally and locally. You can go to the next slide. So I know we'll have time for questions later, but um, if you'd like to ask uh, anything either today or to follow up, you can feel free to send me an email or follow me on Instagram. And thank you for attending today and thank you for the important role that all of you play in strengthening our food system and keeping families healthy. So thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Andy. That was wonderful. And again, I think we could have had a whole hour dedicated to your work and your amazing uh, programming happening in the greater Bay Area. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing a newer friend and a newer partner to my program at UC Davis, and that is um, the Center for Eco Literacy. I think a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of working and meeting with the team there, and um, Adam Kesselman, who is their executive director, um, introduced me to Layla. And Layla uh, spoke to many of our partners in the counties recently on a town hall. And we were just so impressed with what they're doing um, at the center. And I had to have her on this panel. I think she, she rounds it out beautifully. And my heart is always with young people. So she's a specialist in this arena. And I have a, a short bio here I will read about Layla. So Layla Mirandi is a public health professional based in Oakland, California. Her work has focused on chronic disease prevention, child nutrition programs, and school wellness work. In her current role with Center for Eco-Literacy, she supports a statewide network of 89 school districts to serve healthy, freshly prepared school meals made from California-grown food through the Center's California Food for California Kids initiative. And so oftentimes you'll see some really great commercials on TV around what, what's happening in, in the California school space. And a lot of it is the work that's happening behind the scenes by the center. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Layla and uh, stop talking. Thank you uh, so much for that warm introduction and to the team for having us uh, come to speak and present today. Um, I'm definitely grateful to be following up on two very timely and inspiring presentations and to be with all of you who do important work to support our community members throughout the state. Um, yeah, so my name is Layla Mirandi and I work with the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley. Um, we work on food and sustainability education in K through 12 schools. And I manage our California Food for California Kids initiative, which works to increase uh, schools capacity and commitment to serving fresh and locally grown food. And so my goal today is just to share a little bit more about what our organization does and how we've been adapting uh, during COVID-19 alongside our school partners. Next slide, please. Um, some of you on the call may have seen this logo before for our California Thursdays program. Um, this is something that we developed to help introduce using fresh, healthy, locally grown food, starting with just one day a week and then growing from there. Um, our resources and professional development that we provide have helped to promote California Thursdays and support districts that serve nearly a third of the meals in our state. And on the next slide, you can see that sometimes districts start out on this journey with a simple step like a farmer's market salad bar that features California grown produce or something like the next slide where they can continue expanding into other offerings that move more toward the center of the plate and emphasize scratch cooking and local products. So on the left here, we have a school district in Vista, California that's featuring locally made and school nutrition approved tamale alongside lots of California grown fruits and vegetables. And those grape tomatoes there were actually bought directly from a local farm. And on the right, um, a school district in Calistoga is featuring Mary's organic chicken from Fresno along with California grapes, salad, and pesto. And they even use California heirloom wheat there to make a roll from scratch. Um, and so California Thursdays and local food look different in every district that we work with based on their capacity and the different communities they serve, but our organization's really here to just help them along every step of the way. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that one of the services we provide is culinary professional development for staff. We've kind of been a go-to um, for this service in our state. And our sessions really focus on preparing, serving, and promoting school food in ways that are fun and appetizing for youth. 
And although this, tra this is a training, um, we've found that in fact, many school food service staff are already excellent cooks and were simply able to draw on their talent and creativity they already possess. And really this acknowledgement and reinforcement of their skills and values as employees is just a plus for morale and team cohesion in school nutrition programs. Next slide. Um, and we also think that this high quality food deserves high quality marketing, just like we see in the private sector. Um, so we offer a suite of marketing and promotional materials that help districts gain recognition for their important work, as well as, as, well as strengthen their connections with families and the communities that they're serving. And on the next slide, you'll see that one of the most important things we truly have to offer is a growing network of districts that are participating in California Food for California Kids. Um, a place where school food leaders can really take part in our organization's offerings together, but also learn from one another while collectively improving practices across the state and increasingly serving as a model for other states like Kamal was talking about at the beginning of our webinar. Next slide. Um, and like many that we've heard from uh, here today and many of you likely, um, COVID-19 has really given us a reason to swiftly reflect and reassess the ways in which we could best support school nutrition programs especially in those first several weeks of unanticipated school closures where they were coming up with new ways to package and deliver foods more safely for community members and for the staff themselves. Um, on the next slide here, um, you'll see one of the first things we did was partner with another school food organization, Lunch Assist, and we designed some COVID-19 uh, food service safety precautions in collaboration with public health professionals, dietitians, and physicians. Um, next slide. And we also offered lots of different tip sheets, training materials, and um, things that you'll find for free on our website available in English and Spanish. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to visit our website, California Food for California Kids, to see these and many of the other things I'll be sharing about today. Next slide. Um, we also kicked off a community of practice call in March to support the sharing of knowledge, inspiration, and important updates for the field. Um, you'll see that it turns out that this is something the profession really needed. On the next slide, I have a graph that shows um, participation in calls between late March when uh, the calls started at school closures and early July. Um, we've seen participation grow more than fivefold to where we now have participants in the hundreds instead of in the 20s and 30s. And um, we originally intended these uh, calls for school districts in California, but on the next slide, you'll see a map that um, shows that we now have participants from 27 states um, in the country. And so this has really added a lot of richness to our perspective and also connection between school districts and agencies that support them during a challenging time. Um, and if anyone on this call is interested, we certainly invite you to be a part of it too, if it could benefit your work or those who you're serving through your programs. We'll share out a link for uh, registering for those calls. Uh, next slide. Um, so when schools closed, we um, started to discuss as a community how to continue serving quality meals because um, we know that families are depending on this vital resource and daily nutrition for their children. Um, our calls highlighted districts and speakers um, who have helped, um, you know, partners on the call continue to focus on scratch cooking and local foods, despite the constraints that everyone was facing during COVID-19. And many districts were developing innovative packaging solutions on the fly so that meals could be picked up um, very safely and then carried home by families. Next slide. Um, we've also featured lots of ideas for community partnerships that help increase families' access to healthy food while they're visiting schools to pick up meals. So this can include things like partnerships with food banks or schools that serve as uh, the distributors for the Farmers to Family program that Andy was discussing earlier, and which you'll see here uh, pictured on the slide. And we know that as grocery stores were slammed as and many restaurants were closed down, um, school nutrition programs really became a critical piece of food security in our communities. And this was a new hat for districts to wear, but they've really proven to be absolutely perfect for the task. Um, and you'll see here on the next slide that despite all of these new systems and changes, they're still <laughs> finding ways to have fun along the way. Uh, whether it's dressing up as a unicorn or having a local theater or a musical ensemble visit the drive through as folks pick up meals, um, they've really just pulled out all the stops to delight their families and demonstrate lots of leadership and care for the community. Next slide. Um, and working closely with school districts during this time allowed us to learn more about their challenges, um, such as increased expenses and the need for training and equipment that helps keep staff and community members safe. 
Um, and of course, policy that provides increased funding would be an essential way um, to strengthen that vital infrastructure. So through various surveys, sign on letters, um, et cetera, with many of the orgs that you see here on the slide, and also wonderful feedback and testimony from school districts, we were able to <clears throat> work to influence an allocation of additional 112 million in funding for emergency meal service and help pr to protect 10 million in the state budget for California's farm to school programs. And we're excited to share that 8.5 million of that 10 will become a grant program for school districts. Next slide. Um, and we're now working with school districts as back to school planning is kind of top of mind for everyone. I'm sure that you're reading lots about it in the news and seeing it in your feeds every day. Um, so with the task force of directors from throughout our state, we've developed some new planning tools that help um, school nutrition programs plan for different scenarios and protocols that might be required as schools reopen in various stages. Um, these also are all available for free on our website and can be shared very broadly. And uh, keep an eye out because we'll be adding a menu planning resource soon for anyone who's doing work with schools. Next slide. All right, thank you so much. Um, it was really a pleasure to share a little bit more about what we're doing. And if anyone wants to be in touch, um, I invite you to contact me. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Layla. That was fantastic. And I'm going to go on Amazon and look for that big pink blow up a costume and go help out at the school districts here. I just I have something fun like that. So I've been volunteering a bit just to be there to you know, help out as I can on my own time. But I think I need a costume. So you inspired me to make it fun and embarrass my, my teenagers, my own children, um, properly embarrass them. So I think we're going to transition and I think my colleague Deanne is going to take over to um, answer questions and I think there's some business happening in the Q&A button. So I'm going to transfer it over to you, Deanne. Thank you so much. It's an incredible bit of knowledge from all three of our panelists. Kamal, thank you for getting them together and to Brian, Andy, and Layla, thank you so much for all that you do every day to help feed Californians. Um, I, while we're transitioning, we're going to launch a couple of poll questions and uh, for folks who know how to use them on the part of your screen, uh, there'll be a poll that'll pop up and you'll answer your poll. And uh, after we get about half of those um, answered, then we'll just roll on to the half the participants answer, then we'll roll to our next question just to see how we did today. We really wanted to be sure that you have the opportunity um, to get new information, have access to new resources. Uh, there were quite a few mentionings of websites today, and we will get those uh, web links from our speakers and put them in an email and send them out to everybody who signed up today. So uh, if you want to go ahead, for those who are still with us, please uh, vote. And, uh, identify what your answers are to the question on the screen. Uh, in the meantime, we'll, um, ask the question, Brian's answered this in the question and answer box, but I just want to be sure. Riley asked the question about the plans to explain the, expand the PEBT to all school closures. And Brian explained there's a whole lot more detail than just saying yes. So Ryan, if you could extend that a tad bit. Hi. Yeah. The um, the set of circumstances that need to take place in order to allow PEBT, which um, honestly this is the first time we have operated it um, at the state level. Um, but it's not just a matter of requesting it. There has to be certain um, thresholds and triggers in place uh, to get to that point um, in a pandemic. So with there, we were, uh, we were able to operate this for a very short period of time. That eligibility period uh, closed a few weeks ago. Uh, but given the fact that we know this fall, students are going to be home, it's not gonna be business as usual we are already looking to fall to see if we can get approval to operate um, pandemic EBT once again. Um, but it's definitely, it's something that couldn't be stood up on a moment's notice for a short-term event. So the power shutoffs and those PSPS events that we saw last fall, um, unless they were truly like long lasting, 
this isn't the right mechanism for that because there's just too much, um, it's too cumbersome. Uh, that's the short answer to stand it up for like a short term weekend or evening event um, or something that impacts someone for a few days um, or a, a geography. It's, it's not designed for that, um, but certainly for extended school shutdowns, things like that, we are definitely pursuing that for fall. So stay tuned. Thank you. I, I, as uh, one, as you mentioned, actually at the beginning or in the middle of your presentation, uh, this is not going away anytime soon. So it's certainly good to have a process in place that will help us out. Um, so uh, Debbie Friedman has a question. Uh, she's curious whether the state's employee and training program discussed today collaborates with partners like CEDAW to train more workers who can work in the school food sector. And I suspect that may be a Layla question. Hi, yes, I'm just reading through Debbie's question. Um, we have not collaborated yet with the state's employee and training program. Um, I'm definitely interested to learn a little bit more about that. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the issue is, is that there's not a lot of extra funding, yes, for labor to, to do scratch cooking. And I think we're finding during COVID-19 that a lot of um, labor is being redirected toward um, packaging and making sure food is prepared safely. And um, also if you know kids are doing meals in the classroom and things like this, we'll need staff to monitor those types of projects. Um, so I think that schools before COVID-19 of course had a new, you know, an existing need for additional labor. And now we're seeing that that's kind of even more impacted. Um, but I would be interested to learn more about the, um, the state program that you're discussing, Debbie. Thank you for your input. We appreciate that. This and Layla, this is this is Brian. Um, there's, I think, there's a lot to talk through there on the the E and T connection there because I think I think there are there's so much opportunity there and and reasonably flexible funding in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it, so in many ways, I feel like the sky's the limit with E and T. It just takes some um, some of those creative solutions to match with the funding. But I think um, there's a lot to talk through there. Well, good. I'm grateful for participants pointing out opportunities for panelists, too. <laughs> That's a good thing. So um, when we ask the question, were people going to use information from today's webinar to share with their clientele? And nearly half said, yes, definitely, and quite a few, a third said so much. So we're really happy to have had all of you participating with us. Uh, at this point, we normally would ask a series of questions to try to engage uh, all of our uh, attendees. Unfortunately, we're actually out of time. So I think what we want to do is um, put these questions up. And for those people who are with us, who are attendees, if you still have a few minutes to stick with us, if you'd like to type uh, A1 in the chat box to type your response, um, it would be a wonderful opportunity to share what kinds of educational outreach curriculum needs you identify that relate to the food system resilience and through uh, resourcing of answers, perhaps we'll be able to find people who are interested in doing a lot of work together in the future. And you're welcome to send that to uh, all the attendees and panelists or just the panelists. Okay, we are having technical challenges. The life of technology. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, if we'd like, we can scroll through to the next um, questions. Um, for folks who work within ANR, uh, if you've identified research gaps at your local level or regional level, 
and you want to share those with other people or just the panelists, we would appreciate that um, list of um, opportunities. I think we have gaps throughout the system in California and some areas have very different gaps than others. So it's important to understand uh, where information needs to be learned and then how to translate that information to end users. So I think um, if we have any other questions that have come in, I know we had a, a question early on from uh, Mark Bell who wanted to know if there was a way that the UC Master Food Preserver program could perhaps play a larger role in providing food safety training and if that would be helpful at local community level. So I'd be real curious um, from Layla as well as Andy what you folks think about that. Well, I would say it would be very helpful, particularly for our uh, cottage food makers and our small scale food producers. So I think I think there's a lot of opportunity and particularly training needs related to food safety. I think the other piece as well is from the consumer household perspective, there's also more and more opportunities to teach people about uh, their own food preservation and canning and jarring their own foods at home. So particularly if they're buying fresh produce or fresh ingredients and learning about um, fermentation and pickling and things like that. So um, I think that's that to me is a gap right now. And I think there's definitely more opportunities to teach people food preservation, both at the industry and consumer level. Um, and I, I would also be interested to learn more about the um, Master Food Preserver Network. I think that school districts in each of their kind of localities um, are happy to invite new people in to speak with their staff because often, um, especially if it's on a volunteer basis, because they don't often have the resources or in-house um, talent necessarily to teach folks something new or to bring in, you know, outside speakers. Um, so if there were topics, you know, that related to culinary skills or related to food safety, I think like if you do form partnerships with school districts, they would definitely be happy to have guests come in and provide some of that training to their staff. It makes things really um, more interesting and enriching that way. Our Master Food Preserver program is conducted throughout the state, so we'll be sure to get more information to you on that. It's a phenomenal program and uh, certainly relies on volunteers um, as well as good curriculum and good training. So there's a good bit of information available on that. Um, so for folks who are attendees and participating, um, we'd like to prompt you with the next question. If you'd consider working collaboratively to develop a research project uh, on anything you heard today. Um, we did have a question come up. Is this being recorded? Yes, it is. Uh, and it will be available on the Learning and Development Center website once we get that link up. Uh, we'll be emailing out to folks who participated today, sending that link along as well as a list of the various websites and electronic resources that uh, some of our panelists spoke about today. So I think with that, we're um, definitely, uh, we've gone a little bit over time. We want to say thank you so much to all our panelists and to Kamal who took the opportunity to all these folks up and bring them with us. Uh, our next webinar in this series will be the second Tuesday of um, August. Sorry about the July 28th on there. That's today. It'll be August uh, 11th. Uh, and we'll have a conversation with three cooperative extension advisors and a sustainable ag coordinator and ag ombudsman with UCANR over in Marin County. Uh, the three of them on the ins and outs of niche marketing need. Uh, so on behalf of Lynn Schmidt McQuitty, our uh, Healthy Family and Community Strategic Initiative Leader and myself, I want to say thank you so much for joining us and please, um, if you happen to run into any of our panelists, also extend a huge thank you 
for the wonderful information that they've presented to us today. So everyone be safe and have a good day.